we're gonna learn more about uh, metallurgy later. Okay, so the uh, why we heat treat things, uh, the effects that heat treating has on materials, um, of what materials can be heat treated, and how to control heat treating. When we're talking about the blade on the horizontal bandsaw, well, let's 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 step back. We talked a little bit about the automatic hacksaw. They're no longer really in use. They're out there still, um, but they're they're not uh, profitable. Uh, the the automatic hacksaw had, and you've seen regular hacksaw blades for a hand hacksaw. It's just a solid blade, right? And the teeth all point one direction. Well, that whole blade. That entire blade is uh, heat treated. It's hardened, okay? Now, uh, that blade cuts on the forward stroke and it doesn't cut on the back stroke. So, uh, hardening that entire blade uh, makes sense, right? Because um, the, the blade is only operating in a forward momentum. However, you do have to pull it back and you can uh, create small amounts of friction there. But just as a rule of thumb, usually all automatic hacksaw blades were completely hardened. On a horizontal bandsaw, we do not harden the whole blade. And, and this will make more and more sense as you carry on in, in this trade. But uh, only the teeth, guys, only the teeth of the blade are hardened. So that tells you something right, about, right away about heat treating is that you can control the depth of um, material that you heat treat. Uh, so a, a very interesting fact about heat treating, uh, just uh, you don't have to put an entire piece of steel uh, in an oven and heat treat the whole thing. You can control the depth of heat treating that gets done. Um, and on a horizontal bandsaw blade, only the teeth are hardened. And, you probably can understand the benefit of that for one good reason, is that blade, it sits flat, remember, on the pulleys, but then it's forced to turn straight as it comes across the workpiece. So hardened materials, when you harden a material, you increase its brittleness. So you can imagine that if we're putting uh, that kind of a twist uh, on a fully hardened blade, it won't take long before that blade fractures, right? So that's why only the teeth are hardened and it allows the rest of that blade uh, to stay uh, flexible, okay? So just a, a point to remember, uh, especially if you don't have a textbook, uh, only the teeth of a horizontal saw blade are hardened. Okay. Uh, we've already touched on this, but just uh, um, emphasis on this point. Um, the teeth on your horizontal uh, saw blade uh, they are meant to cut in one direction, right? So um, you have to know how your saw cuts, right? Uh, the, the chips, the, uh, sorry, the, the blade typically uh, cuts around and then as it's coming towards you, or if you're standing here and the blade's cutting this way, uh, the material is being cut uh, uh, this direction, right? From left to right. It's uh, pulling the chips through, and in some cases, uh, it will push the chips through. Um, so, just so you know, you you want to make sure that the saw that you're working on, that the the teeth are pointing in the direction of the cut. Okay, so obviously, um, that would make total sense for you guys. Okay, so that covers our material on the uh, horizontal bandsaw. So what we want to talk about now, we want to move to <clears throat> the vertical bandsaw. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, 
So um, I want to start this uh, lesson by making one important um, comment. Uh, if you're going to choose, if you're going to choose a saw to cut material, almost always, almost always, it will be the horizontal bandsaw. Okay, so it's designed uh, to cut material um, quickly, efficiently, and repeatedly. Uh, one of the uh, options on some uh, horizontal bandsaws is um, a material stop. You can set that stop drag your work out to the stop, close your vise, and hit go. And on some of these saws, what will happen, when that saw blade comes down and cuts that piece off, the blade will go up, the vise will unclamp, it will feed the, the bar in till it hits that stop, the vise will automatically close, and it'll do another cut. So, uh, so beneficial, you can imagine. If you gotta cut 100 blocks for a customer, for parts you have to make, having an automatic feeding system with a stop would be hugely beneficial. So this is like kind of the more um, universally used saw. If you have a choice of buying two saws, uh, that's the one you're going to buy. Uh, but there, there's a lot of value to having a vertical or a contour band saw. Um, it really only consists of three main parts. I'll bring a, a couple pictures here of the uh, vertical band saw. So I hope this is nice and clear for you guys. <laughs> so on the uh, vertical bandsaw, the, the three main parts, if you're taking notes, okay, the three main parts is number one is the base. You can see that down in the bottom right hand corner of this uh, picture. The uh, second main part of this saw is the column. And you can see that uh, on the right side of this picture, uh, up kind of closer to the top there, between saw guides and head. So uh, the column, and we're going to talk about this a bit more when we get to milling, uh, but that column is um, uh, vertical to the base of, uh, of this saw and uh, allows for uh, other options on some of these saws when it comes to uh, maneuvering that table or raising or lowering uh, the head or the table. Uh, the third main uh, component is the head and of course that's uh, where the power is, right? That's where the saw blade uh, will be coming through, comes down from the top, travels down through that uh, saw guide just like we had on the horizontal, right? We had two saw guides, well here we have uh, a single saw guide that, that guides that um, saw blade into the table, which is, the, it's clear, right? There's clearance there. The saw blade goes down through the table, around another pulley. As you see in the bottom left-hand corner, it says lower pulley, not visible. It's because it's inside that, that uh, door, just like on the horizontal bandsaw. Just imagine taking that horizontal bandsaw and standing it upright. You've got the same pulleys, and the blade does the same thing. It travels between those pulleys. Uh, but um, the something really, really uh, uh, special about the contour bandsaw is that a majority of these saws have some uh, additional features. So if you look on the left side of that picture, guys, you, you'll notice a, a, a butt welder. Okay. So on these saws, uh, if a blade breaks. Instead of ordering pre-made blades, you can make your own blades. So you would order a length of saw blade. Uh, you would take that saw blade, and I, I'll blow this up a little bit for us. So you would take that saw blade, and right here, uh, there, there's a little opening here with two handles. So you would take uh, one end of a piece of raw saw blade and then uh, you would cut the other end to the length that you need and there's a way of figuring out uh, how long a piece of saw blade you need. So you would cut a straight piece of saw blade to the length that you want and then you would put one side of the saw blade here and then you would put the other side of the saw blade here. And let's see if I got a picture, I might. 
Maybe I don't. But I can get you one. Okay. So anyways, you put those two ends of the saw blade and you butt them up against each other square. So what I do is I take um, the one saw blade, I come in from this side, and I bring the other one and I butt it up right square. And then this, this blade goes, this is going to be one continuous blade when we're done, but it's just one length right now, right? So I'm pulling it around and I'm putting it inside those two slots that are on the front of that butt welder. And then what I do is these two levers, I swing one of these levers up and I swing this one up this way. And what that does is it clamps both ends of this blade and holds them in position. And what we want, guys, is we want uh, this line right here, where this line where the two ends of the saw blade are butting up against each other. We want to make sure that they are straight. Uh, what we don't want is we we don't want them we don't want them like this. We want them straight, standing upright, and we want them not up or down from each other. We want them butted up against each other as if it were one blade. Once these two handles are engaged, uh, then what we do is on the side of the butt welder here, we have exactly what you, you think it is, is we have uh, the ability to weld. So there'll be a button uh, or a button up here somewhere where you will just uh, hit spot weld and it will instantly uh, weld that blade right down that seam. So that's why it's so important that not only is it sitting perfectly in line this way, but that it's also sitting perfectly in line this way, because when that welds, it's gonna weld on that seam. It's gonna fill that gap that you can't see with your bare eye. Now, it will still try and weld if, if it's not sitting straight this way, and it will still try and weld if it's sitting cockeyed this way. But as you can imagine, it's, it's not going to be a successful weld. So once you engage that weld, uh, that push that button and you weld that blade together, then what happens is this area, uh, maybe I'll move this away from my face so I'm not talking through this. <laughs> so this area where this blade met this blade, now you have um, this little weld all the way down, right? All the way down that seam. But all of this area, all of this area here, and all of this area here, uh, do you know what's happened? Do you know what's happened to that area? Uh, when you, if you've got experience in welding, you know that when you, when you weld metal together, you are superheating, right? <laughs> you're superheating that material. In effect, what you're doing is you're heat treating. So you have now got hardened material on both sides of that weld. And we already mentioned that it's only the saw blade itself, the teeth itself, uh, you know, to a certain depth that is heat treated. Uh, we can't afford for this to be hardened because as you harden something, it becomes brittle. So this, even though this is welded and now is one piece, it is not as tough as the rest of that blade. This becomes the weak point. So once we've welded this, and you'll get an opportunity um, in the lab, and you can ask to do it whenever you want. And you go see your instructor and say, could you please show me uh, how to weld a blade, right? Because that's actually one of your competencies that you want to get done. So you uh, weld the blade, now it's heat treated. You can't use it yet for two reasons. One, it's heat treated, and two, you got this lump of uh, bead weld down the middle of that blade. Well, on this, on this little butt welder contraption here, you also have a grinding wheel. So it depends on it depends on the brand, right? Up here is your uh, a blade cutter or uh, the blade cutter, so you can cut your blade to the length you want. This is your welder, and usually on the side here or on the underside 
is a very, very small grinding wheel. And what you do is you will take your blade and you will hold it up under the grinding wheel, just kind of push it back and forth and remove that high spot on your weld. And then you'll flip it over and you'll do the same on the other side. And in your technology machine tools book, it, it tells you about the importance of making sure that uh, you remove a certain amount of that weld. And, and think about this for a second. If I don't bring that weld down to a certain height, you know what's going to happen every time that blade goes around and comes through your part? It's, you're going to hear a nice saw cut, zzz, tick, tick, zzz, tick, tick, right? And eventually it's going to wear these teeth down and it's going to create rubbing, right? This is just going to rub and it's going to rub and it's going to rub and then it's going to recreate a weak spot here. So you want to grind that weld down so that it's the same width as the rest of the blade. This is not do it once and you got it forever, okay? I, you might do it nine or ten times and be like, oh, I, I'm never going to get this. You'll get it, right? One of the things we learn in machining, and you may not understand it right now, but trust me, you will. We have something we called feel. And it's with every machine, it's with every operation, it's with every tool, it's with every material. There is a feel that you cannot teach and you can't explain. Okay, the only way I can best describe this is, do you remember, maybe you don't, if you're old like me, you probably forgot and tried to forget, but uh, if you can remember the first time you drove a car, uh, you got behind that wheel, and what did you know about driving? Well, you, you had to understand kind of the basics, right? You know, you need to know the basics so that you can get behind the wheel or so I can get you behind a machine. But you don't know what happens when you turn the wheel a quarter turn or half a turn in either direction. You don't know what's going to happen if you put uh, two extra pounds of force on the gas pedal per inch. Uh, there's all these nuances when it comes to driving, right? Well, can somebody teach you all of those nuances? Do you even want to know? Imagine how long it would take you to learn how to drive. So. You, you need the basics. You need to have a, a, a basic comprehension of what you're about to get yourself into. From there on in, it's practice. Get behind the wheel and get behind the wheel as much as you can because eventually some of these things that you're automatically doing behind the wheel, okay, it comes from a feel, right? And, and um, you drive a car long enough, you notice a new sound. No, the guy next to you you just picked up for work won't notice it. But you'll notice it because you're behind the wheel all the time, right? So uh, you notice those little things. And that's kind of similar to this feel, right? You, you get behind the, the, the controls of these machines and you do stuff, right? You cut stuff. You change the feed rate. You change the spindle speed. You, you weld a blade. You weld another blade. You break a part. You break a blade. All of that will all kind of form for you a feel for that machine. And you'll be able to pick up on little things that, oh, I gotta stop, something's not right. No one else will pick up on, right? And, that, and, and you'll get that for every single machine, every tool, every sound you hear in the shop, right? All of those things all combine and help you get the feel of what you're working on. So, and that's what we're talking about when it comes to welding these blades. It, it, you'll do it and you might do it the first time be like, oh <laughs> that was easy right and then you can't do it again for two weeks right it, it's it was just fluke that you got it but once you've done it enough times it's those little tiny things that you wouldn't have picked up on before that you just know you know if I if I try and weld it now I'm gonna have to do it again right it, it could be just how this machine how the blade cutter works uh, maybe it's dull and, and it gives you a little rollover and you never noticed it before, but now you appreciate that little rollover. You're trying to grind off before you can butt them up together. So when we talk about the feel, we're not talking about one thing. We're talking about the experience that comes behind what you're doing and eventually it just makes sense. And you do a lot of these things automatically. You pick up on things automatically. You, you, you'll watch a guy that's been in the machine shop for 40 years 
who doesn't make a mistake, right? And you just be, oh my gosh, how am I ever gonna get there? It's the feel, right? He's just been doing it long enough that he picks up on things before they happen or during the process. So um, you will get the feel on all your machines. And especially when you end up working in a facility where you get to be on machines all the time, I'm gonna just, guys, if I can give you some good advice, if you get a chance to work on a machine, take it. If you can be trained on something, take the training. Every little bit will make a huge difference for you. You may not completely get it right now, but it's like uh, if you had a chance at 16 for six months to drive a car, six months to drive a motorcycle, six months to drive a big rig, six months to drive a tractor, you know, six months to learn to fly a plane. Can you imagine, even you may never be a pilot, but can you imagine how all of that experience can help you in whatever your career is that involves some type of driving, right? It, it will all benefit you. So if you can get on a machine, take that opportunity. Okay, let's um, move away from the blade cutting. Um, that's something that you're gonna have to just, it's one of those things you gotta get your hands dirty, guys. You gotta get on the, the vertical bandsaw and ask for some test pieces and practice, practice, practice cutting and welding blades. Um, okay, I, I don't want to go into too much detail about the blades themselves. Uh, we will cover a little bit more of this when we get to bench work processes. But on the vertical bandsaw, uh, there's three common tooth forms, okay? And you need to know these. Okay, so one is the precision. Okay, it's the precision tooth form, okay? Uh, I might have a picture... took a lot of pictures today. I just can't remember which ones I, I kept and which ones I didn't. Okay, it is in your techno technology machine tools book in uh, unit 36. Um, if you don't have it, maybe, uh, uh, Sandy, if, if, if you could, maybe get one of the guys to take a picture and send it to you or um, make a note of needing to look that up. But there's a picture of these three blade types. Okay, the second one is the claw tooth. Okay, sorry, I got I made a mistake and shook this while it was open and covered my computer in ink. There we go. Okay, the second one is the claw tooth, and the third one is the buttress. Okay, these are the three most common saw blade types or saw blade um, tooth forms. Okay. Um, the absolute most common out of all of these is the precision, okay? Uh, it it kind of will cover a multitude of cutting operations. Um, there's, there's advantages to the other blades, but I'm not going to get into them right now, okay? So if you're, if odds are any vertical bandsaw that you're going to get on is going to have that precision uh, tooth form on it. Um, Okay, another thing that we need to understand about blades is the pitch. If this were my one inch of saw blade, okay, if that was my one inch of saw blade or my 25 millimeters of saw blade, one, two, three, four, five, so it would be a five mil pitch, okay? Uh, that's how it would be identified. If this were one inch, then it would be um, a five tooth per inch pitch, okay? So saw blades measure it um, based on the number of teeth per inch, but pitch as a description means from the point on one um, tooth or one thread to the exact same point on the next tooth or next thread. So they, they, the word has two uh, different meanings for its two different applications. So when you're trying to describe the pitch of a blade, remember you're talking about when it comes to the inch pitch tooth, okay, you're talking about how many teeth per inch. When you're talking about primarily thread forms, pitch is the distance from a point on that thread to the exact same point 
on the next thread and is expressed in uh, how many threads per inch, okay? I, and believe me, this will make sense, okay? So um, maybe, let's just leave this for now for um, uh, thread cutting and let's focus on this then just for our blade, okay? The pitch that we're talking about for a blade is the number of teeth per inch or the number of teeth per um, 25 millimeters, okay? So those are the two things we wanna remember for the blade. And we'll come back to this part of it when we do the, um, the thread cutting uh, in our uh, lathe operations. Okay. Hey, I've never had to do so much writing on this board. It's gonna, I never compensated for the amount of clean time. You're gonna have to give me a second to give this a quick, quick wipe. I wanna try and keep this clean so I can see what I'm doing. So, last point on metal cutting saws, and then we'll move on to our last subject. Guys, when you are cutting any material on any uh, on either the horizontal bandsaw or the vertical bandsaw, there is a rule that must be followed. At every, any given time, Maybe I'll put it this way. Okay, and this is the back side of the blade. And this is the. Okay, we'll just leave it like that. At any given time. Two teeth must be in contact with the workpiece. So where this becomes an issue is if you're cutting a piece of material that is really, really thin, right? And your saw blade uh, is here, right? Uh, and it's cutting that direction. Uh, when it's cutting through this material, it has to have at least two teeth engaged in that material as it cuts. The thinner that material, uh, the lesser, less and less likely that the saw blade that you have installed in that machine is going to function properly. Um, can, can you think of a reason why it would be important to have at least two teeth engaged at any given time on a workpiece? If you only have one tooth in contact with that part, uh, then you, you get the possibility of that material being lodged between the two teeth, even though that blade's moving, right? Uh, but the other problem is, is that you don't have that second tooth to stabilize the blade in the vertical direction. It can now do this with only one, one tooth, right? And the, the bigger problem is, is if that's consistent, uh, you're gonna start sh uh, shearing the teeth off that blade. So yeah, good one, Sandy. That's exactly that's exactly the reason. Okay, so that um, that brings us to the end of our saw cutting. Okay.